and to mention was this new nightclub that's opened up in the UK, specifically in London, called Beams, which is spearheaded by the same people who helped to open and run Printworks when it first launched. And now they've kind of pivoted away from Printworks and they're now doing uh, Beams. And that company is called London Warehouse Projects, also known as LWE. And from what I've seen of Beams in the pictures and whatnot, it looks pretty spectacular. I am one of those people who has a bit of a soft a bit of a soft space in my heart for these big mega club type places i think they serve they're just as important as your underground 500 capacity 100 capacity venues i think the ability to put on a production of this scale on a weekly basis with some of the biggest acts in the world and have it be safe and have it be entertaining all that kind of stuff to appeal to normies is something that i think is super in, in, in important i feel like these raves play an integral part into the overall ecosystem of nightlife and in general i just like the little change of it i like to go to like i said a dingy underground basement bar somewhere with crappy sound system and terrible equipment but a really talented person playing behind the decks and i also like to go somewhere where the dj isn't that impressive but the lights are amazing and they have fog machines and all this sort of malarkey i'm a big fan of it but the only thing that i don't like about these mega clubs especially when this normie is involved is this culture of just trying to capture every Every single moment look at the sea of fucking mobile phones staring at the fucking dj and of course the, the the way the stage is set up the way they've kind of set up the entire room or the space itself causes itself or lends itself for people to get these really cool pictures and there's something i remember reading someone says something when they go when it goes into production they actually think about how people are going to film it they think about how it looks in landscape how it looks in portrait because i guess most people hold their phone up in a portrait mode to get instagram stories and stuff and they build their production or their live sets and rigs based on that kind of idea so it makes sense why this thing is kind of a square with this sort of ring and these sort of lights that kind of beam into the djs as they're playing behind there it makes them look like they're in some sort of sci-fi film or something thing with a bevy of their hangers on at the background and all of them happen to be dudes every single one of them right capturing content capturing content capturing content it's just like how much is enough and you're going to a place like this you've got your nice little fade on you're enjoying yourself you probably kept it up and maybe peeled up and got some drinks in you and instead of just enjoying and absolutely absorbing the event you spend all your time pointing your phone at the fucking djs and basically looking at them perform through your phone which is pretty redacted but also also, it's funny because you see people doing this, but then you hear people taking the piss out of people like myself who maybe stay at home sometimes and watch DJ live streams on YouTube. This is watching a live stream and going to a rave and watching a rave through your phone. They're probably on the same level of corny and lame and a bit losery. They're probably on the same level. If anything, staying at home watching a stream is less, lo less losery, less corny and less lamey because you're staying at home. But if you've decided to get ready you know, get a babysitter, uh, book an Airbnb, stay in a hotel, get dressed, get a haircut, get your toes did, nails did, and you go there only to just point the phone at the stage. So look through your camera screen at the DJ who's playing in front of you or the artist. That's a bit of a waste of money and a waste of time. But in general, you can't really, you know, be too hard on this because these kind of venues do attract people who like to do this kind of thing. And if you're LWE and you want to appeal to the um, the, the common folk, the normies, quote unquote, the non sceny people who I think in general do keep the scene afloat. I think we've basically seen, especially now post pandemic, how important that kind of normie fan was. That person that's just, you know, after a Friday night at work um, is struggling for places to go after the party and they just pop into X or Y or they pop into Phonics um, they pop into Mix or to Color Factory they pop into all these little places just to just to kind of extend the night they don't really care who's playing but they just want to go somewhere where there's music playing and they've got alcohol you know serving at the bar that's all they want and those people I think basically um, kept the scene alive in some regards and of course all the foreigners too especially some of our brothers and sisters in the EU in places like France Germany and obviously uh, Spain and stuff but now now we're outside the EU and it's a bit difficult to come back in and a lot of those people also just went back home and decided to kind of you know settle down over there it really has changed what these scenes and what these clubs look like in general but you can definitely tell it's thinned out a lot look at pictures from like
like 2018 to 2019 to now and it's not the same and maybe it has to do with just the general cost of living as well do you know what I mean people maybe just have don't have the money to kind of spend to kind of go to a rave because in general going to a rave it doesn't matter if you go abroad or you stay in the UK especially if you're going to indulge in some of the adult you know materials you're essentially going to spend anywhere between 50 to 100 dollars before you've even had a drink sometimes just on your ticket and the adult materials then once you add all the drinks and stuff and maybe an uber bag or maybe a cheeky mcdonald's on the way home you might be looking at 200 quid for what how long entertainment you're really having you're only out for maybe six hours maybe you spend four of those hours on the dance floor actually on the dance floor if you add it all together it's not that great value for money to be fair so maybe if you go in there and you you know you pay that money you're probably involving your rights to just point your phone at the thing and because you're gonna say look like that fucking denzel washington um meme in it i'm gonna leave you with something i'm gonna leave you with something i'm from around the way do you know what i mean like you're definitely gonna leave you with something after paying 50 quid to see people play but that aside there's a review courtesy of mixed mag um regarding beams i'm quickly gonna read here just to kind of give you an idea what it's about and to kind of talk about some things that they mentioned here in the article, it says as follows. Um, this is titled for Mixed Mag, actually, a review of Beam's opening party. Um, it's not an overstatement to say we're experiencing a, cri a crisis in nightlife. The drum shed, Space 289, the Coors, original home in Ashley Road, have all been shuttered in the last 12 months while Capital Club in Juggernaut Printworks looks to be closed for a number of years after this big NYD send-off as development to convert the Surrey Key site into offices goes forward. By the way, fuck Printworks, man. I went there recently. Great, I had a good time. But they sold me a fucking lemon. For the longest time, they kept telling us that that Dixon party or maybe a couple of others afterwards will be the last ones. And then they got a little extension and now it's heading all the way through to New Year's Day. Come on, man. They did they pulled a fast one they pulled the sports direct like you know last sale and um, everything must go and it kept being open for like years and years and years until it finally did close so clever people but fuck them it continues Baldwick, the team behind print work the drum sheds and more announced news of a new east london space back in june to the light of the cities that ravers desperate for some um Resusc resuscitation in the scene located within a sprawling estate of rundown warehouses the beam stands out immediately with its distinctive peeling paintwork array of exotic house plants and wide victorian windows the annoying thing about beams just to interject here is that it is if i'm not mistaken it's at the ting and lao factory which is near like canning town custom housey type area of all victoria where i used to live right and where my parents used to live and where i kind of grew up chct stand up and it's really annoying these places because they never ever 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 book people who are actually local from their area there are plenty of people from their area who got their start playing on pirate radio who have now transitioned to playing more dance music stuff myself included and you never see us playing in these places instead they get people from far-flung places to play in these really grassroots local venues that are intrinsically tied to like the dance music heritage of east london it would be great if they could kind of intermingle or interweave or join could whatever that word is some of the people that live locally to that place to actually tell the full entire story just building that place or setting that place up the way they did it is to me just a, a, a weird rectangular symbol of gentrification in the club scene set your shop up wherever it may be but don't actually integrate the local community it's annoying but again who am i in it formerly a sugar factory run by tate and lyle the venue has a surprisingly idyllic facade um delicate light flows from every direction okay cool you're sucking them off too much you continue here the venue's fifty-five thousand square foot expanse ensures a good chunk of your first visit is spent getting your bearings and staring around the bewilderment at its sheer scale this sounds like a bit of a paid job to be fair spread across two mammoth club rooms a small bar in a chill out area plus an expansive courtyard there's plenty of ground to cover like, let's be real what's it actually going to look like it's going to look like a big warehouse space with a good sound system inside it you know some exposed brick right concrete cables all over the place and shit like what else is it going to look like these guys are acting like they're walking into a Zaha Hadid building or something. Like It's not going to be that deep. The courtyard is located just past security, a flat concrete stretch brimming with food stores and seating areas and punters holding their phones aloft, trying to get a hold of their mates. Once inside, there's a con confounding variation of areas to choose from. Tucks upstairs away from the pounding subs is room free, a stylish bar with comfortable sofas and a cocktail menu, perfect for stare out the window and recharge. In contrast, room two is reminiscent of the dingy underground heyday of a rave, 
dark ray filled with gems of light bouncing around this low ceiling, making an intimate space for those who really want to stomp. The OPD lights are sub and Dallas Flowers and Max Dean. So there's three rooms in there. Now the main event, room one, slipping through the doors and along the venues glow red door corridors is an experience in itself to come face to face with this prestigious amphitheater of a dance floor. Even musically, the music here is less rave and more spectacle with Hot Sis 82 slamming into, slamming out a heavy tech house inclined selection all brought to life by some choice of strobes and breathtaking backdrop of the sunset through the condensed, um, condensated windows. He's, fo he's followed by the headliner Michael Bibby who's illuminated with a dex by the ring of light shaped in the Elevate logo, um, draped around him in all sides like a curtain. Each beam of the warehouse is strapped with his own lighting and sound system being me Meaning, regardless of your position in the crowd, you're still getting a full experience. That's what I mean about them setting it up to be perfect for Instagram and shit. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing blocking your line of sight unless these kind of beams or these, I don't think, are they called beams or these are beams? I don't know what these are called um, that go up. So there's nothing blocking your line of sight, elevated and stuff. So it's pretty decently set up. But that's a meaty crowd, in it? Michael Bibby shifts tickets. You cannot deny that guy shifts tickets. Doesn't matter where he plays, people will come out in their droves to come and see him. That's a that's a lot of people. That's probably the most I've seen in terms of pictures, in terms of people being in clubs. That's crazy. It turned flying in straight for my beef. Bibi rushed to the decks. I was getting a little stressed out in traffic, causing a delay and nervous at the time, he says. But stepping on the stage and hearing the roar from the crowd, as soon as I ended, it melted all those fears away and reminded me while I was home. He adds, it was both exciting and the privilege to be able to host these first shows in a new space in my hometown. Being born and raised in London, huh? Where is he from? Is he from Croydon or is he actually from London? I don't know. Let's go. I was always considered the capital a leading cultural city for electronic music, so I was really happy when I got the call. This doesn't sound like somebody from London would say, in it? Leading cultural city. Or did he even write this? Or did his agent, like, he's probably getting out of his face. He didn't write it. He didn't say this. The Solid Cruise founder starts off strong with a pulsating bass of Beltram smack yo, um, earning a frenzied response from the crowd. Phones are waving, screams of fuck off. <laughs> God, I love tech house people, man. Honestly, you know, I love tech house people. As much as people hate them and shit, they have fun. And I know the phones are annoying and they're all wearing fucking Dior and Balenciaga sneakers and shit. And all the boys look the same and all the girls look the same with their makeup and their fake eyelashes and the dresses and shit. Whatever. Say what you want about them. But these motherfuckers have fun and they spend money. They buy tickets and they go out on the lash. They go out They go out specifically to spend as much money as possible. They don't go out on like, you know, people like the ones I know in the scene who go and buy fucking loads of tins before they enter the rave. They might be snick of cheeky vodka in. Do you know what I mean? They, they just drink water and orange juice at the bar. These guys actually buy. They buy flipping doubles. They're buying beers. They're buying rounds. Do you know what I mean? Like they're probably buying some stuff in the street food section. They might even buy some merch if you got it for sale. They don't, they're not tight with their money whatsoever. And then when they're actually on the dance floor, they're having fun. They're dancing, they're making noises, they're singing along to bass lines. Like when I went to Half Baked recently um, to see, I forgot his name, I keep forgetting his name, but it doesn't matter. But when I went to Half Baked recently, it was kind of a reminder of it. Like, don't get me wrong, the crowd is maybe a little bit sketchy. You don't want to step on certain people's toes or you might end up getting your face stomped in. But overall, everyone's really nice and everyone's there to have legitimately a good time. There's not a lot of like stunting and worrying about what you're wearing and shit. Obviously, you can if you want to, but everyone was kind of just chill. And I kind of remember, I kind, it kind of, I kind of forgot what that was like to be in a place where people are chill. And obviously, because they're from my part of London, in general, the people that'll be into that kind of tech house you've seen, it kind of, you know, filled my heart up with joy to see people who I kind of grew up with at those places. But the phone thing, man, this is why you can't ever do Berlin in, in London. You can't do Berlin in London, the whole no the phones thing. You have to do it maybe in certain you know venues but you can't do this because this is just not something we just don't know about it it's not something that we know about it's not something that we care about it's just not something that you can do here no way it's like trying to introduce 
no phones at somewhere like Dubai or something, right? Where it's all about show and materialism and I'm here, you're not kind of thing. It's just impossible to do. Look at that. There's like a sea of phones here. This picture of, I think, Hot Sense 82 playing behind the decks. It's just a sea of phones that he's facing. Just people dead ass looking at him. That's one of the things I have to say is being a DJ is really off putting. When you're playing and people are just staring at you, it's already worse for me when I'm playing in venues because there's hardly anyone there. So when you are looking at somebody, they kind of feel like, you're holding them captive when you look at them. It's like, oh, hey, someone's look, someone's looking at me play. Don't leave, don't leave. When really you're just looking. But people have that weird thing. They see you looking like, oh, shit. Now you see me. Now I can't leave. But it's probably even worse if you're a relatively well-known person because just all you're going to have are all these faces just staring at you. They're just like, and they're all in the straight line looking at you directly. They're not looking anywhere else. They're not dancing. No one's got their back to you. They're just staring at you. <laughs> it's crazy he continues after the set bb said he felt incredible adding this show was almost so it was also the first time putting on my own elevate um brand showcase a concept based on the empowering and energizing people to reach their highest potential it seemed to work but what what does that mean that's like the kind of bio you'd see for a, a fitness clothing brand something on, on flipping instagram isn't it it says it says a lot, but what does it actually mean? A concept based on empowering and energizing people to reach their highest potential. What is that like a cat brand? Like what 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 is this? I don't get it. Anyway, a few days after the grand opening, Patrick Topin, who debuted alongside Dennis Salter at the Beams, summed up his experience in a new venue, tweeting, "Such an amazing addition to London UK scene." That is the biggest takeaway upon exit. Okay, cool. More, more, more from Patrick Turpin at ten, eh? <laughs> or Dennis Salter. Regardless of the preference of the scale of the venue, the Beams is an ambitious space which is benefit for the UK clubbing sphere and inspire those around the capital to follow suit. The Beams must just be the beacon of hope. London nightlife needed. This feels like payola to me. Like they paid for this and sponsored it, which is not a bad thing. But I think they should have kind of specified this. This is this is crazy. There's not one slight on this in terms of it being bad, the cues, nothing, just all too much praise. But, you know, these club reviews do this kind of thing. So I guess I'm going to have to check it out for my own, um, you know, curiosity because I'm, I'm somebody who likes to see these things myself. I don't like just to go off the word of somebody else. So I'm definitely going to check it out. And so far, having checked the website, let's see what they got here. Let's actually give it a refresh and see if I miss anything out here. But the website itself, what they got coming up, they've got Hacienda Night coming up this weekend with everybody you would expect to see there at Hacienda Party. Um, they've got a Messier Plax Night. He's playing alongside the Bamboo, Ra Bamboo Rambo. The Bambi Rambo, I don't know who that is. Dennis Horvat, I know, and a few other people I know here. Um, okay, move on from that one. And then the following week, you got Junction 2. I know a few people on there as well. It was pretty decent. And there's a Jamie Jones night on what? The Let 19th. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's see the power because Michael Ruby sold his one out. Is Jamie Jones one still available? Yeah, they're all available, right? Tickets on sale. Let's see if the Jamie Jones one is still on sale because the Michael Bibby power of getting in there and selling tickets is quite incredible. Yeah, my, Jamie Jones one is still available in terms of tickets. Interesting. There was a time where you couldn't, there was no way you could buy tickets for Jamie Jones event so close to the event or something. You have to buy them way in advance, but I guess things change, innit? Things definitely change. Let's see what they've got here. Ah, no, they're not actually available, see? Okay, uh, he's still got the power. The tickets are not available. It says they're available, but if you look at the right-hand side, they've all been X'd out. Every release, first, second, third, fourth and fifth everything even pre-entry at 2 p.m oh yeah true it closes at half 10 doesn't it that's insane it actually closes at half 10 it's one of those kind of venues that opens at um what's it open at? it opens at uh 11 or something yeah there you go that's the time there 12 p.m to 10 30 so it's one of those kind of places where you can go and basically make it home in time to catch the last trains and whatnot so pretty decent We'll definitely be checking it out myself sooner rather than later. We'll definitely be checking it out.